back to learning. Um, so we have a very exciting uh, one hour for you here. You want to first tell you a little bit about what action learning is, but it's not going to be me. It's going to be the voices of our students, faculty, telling you through a video. And then we are going to hear from one of my most delightful colleagues, um, Barbara Dyer, about a very exciting new course, USA Lab. Welcome. I'm so excited to see so many of you who I know, actually. Um, and then after that, we have two of our hosts, actually two of our alums, who are now hosts of Action Learning. They're still engaged with the program in a different capacity beyond being students. So that's the range of different notes that we're going to touch today. And with that, we want to start a little bit with what is Action Learning all about and how does it help our student learn? Thanks, Action learning is one of the things that drew me to Sloan. You take what you are taught in a classroom and you apply it into the real world in a real context. It's a group of people who are on the line together to deliver something of value and to support each other's learning. How do we take what we've learned in the classroom, our background, our experiences, and uh, bring them to bear on taking on this task? They are learning about structured approach to problem solving. They are learning about teamwork. They are learning about collaboration. You're living a real life case study through action learning. The challenge for us was being able to condense everything down from theory, from the academic side, and then relay it in real world, in real time. It's learning how to negotiate a scope, how to understand what is the question we're going to be answering here. You're getting to draw on knowledge, spaces, skills, and experience that each of the team members bring. Someone with a marketing background works with somebody with an IT background, works with a doctor, works with somebody who is an analytics undergraduate. Learning how to work with a team that comes from completely different backgrounds, but we all learned a lot about our own leadership skills, how best to work with each other, and how to bring out the best that everyone had. Because of my actual learning experience, I lead teams differently, I think differently about how to approach problems. We like to step back, reflect, and, and find ways for them to Broader learnings to learn some new things, but most importantly, to think in new ways about what they already know. The opportunity to work on a big challenge for a company while getting feedback and support from faculty each step of the way. Our job is to help facilitate the students' learning, to help navigate them as they're working on their deliverables. Unless you really go out there and put those learnings to the test and make mistakes. You really don't learn. This was not an exercise. This was not a report that was going to never be read. We created something that's going to change this company's business, and that was incredibly rewarding. We cannot give them a book and say, OK, read the book and then become an expert in dealing with uncertainty, ambiguity, and complexity. So apart from a really great academic skill set that you pick up at school, this gives you that practice of improvising and living in the real world. That's the whole MIT ethos, is to invent and then implement and work to create something that doesn't exist. Learning by doing, men's and manos, is very important because they can see how the theory that we teach in the classroom connects in practice. It's really synonymous with our motto and our mission of developing principal innovative leaders. It will change the world. we have it's about 15 to 20 in a given year uh, and one of our newest courses is USA lab um, so it gives me a lot of pleasure to introduce Barb to you very briefly Barbara Dyer is a senior lecturer and executive director of the good companies good jobs initiative at the Sloan School formerly she was the president and CEO of the Hitachi Foundation and Barbara has spent a lot of her time uh, looking at the opportunities of what does business play? What kind of role does business play in society? She focuses her attention at the intersection of people, profit, and technologies, and is working to facilitate the cross-fertilization of ideas about making work work for everyone in the 21st century. Today, Barbara joins us to share how students engaged and what they learned 
while they were working with community-based foundations and organizations in economically disadvantaged regions. Please join me in welcoming Barbara Dyer. I felt like just stopping at the end of the video and saying any questions, because what more do we need to say? That was a fantastic, fantastic video. And I think it is the first time I've seen it. Ooh, where did she come from? <laughs> This is great. It was wonderful. And now I've got to figure out how to do this. Um, let's see if this will forward. Is there something I need to know? Just enter? Yes. OK. Hi, everyone. <laughs> We're here. I am delighted to have this opportunity to get to know a little, little bit about all of you. I hope you'll have questions, and, and I'll try to make my presentations brief enough just to whet your appetite for a conversation. The Good Companies, Good Jobs initiative is relatively new. It's about a year old. And it is, as Ermi said, it's about making work work in the 21st century with a particular emphasis on making work work for those who are uh, more likely to be left out of the success of the economy um, and who are be, whose jobs are being transformed um, by all sorts of changes that are reshaping our economic lives. So we, we look at how to make work successful for those who are working in manufacturing and in retail and in hospitality and, and what, what can we say about these sectors, what can we say about work, and how do we make work better. We concentrate at this intersection of people and profits, trying to understand the relationship between good jobs and successful companies. We try to build a research base that is very practically oriented, that is looking at what's happening uh, on the factory floor, in the firms themselves, what's happening with people in these places. And we try to cultivate a really provocative and deep dialogue about work, and why shouldn't we? Here we are at a school of management. You are all alums. How many of you manage people? It's a pretty high percentage of the people in the room. How much time did you spend focusing on managing people while you were here? 50%, 20%, 10%, 100%? I mean, was it enough? Probably, in my career, the hardest, absolutely the hardest thing that I've ever done uh, throughout my career is manage people, and yet we don't spend a whole lot of time on that. So the Good Companies, Good Jobs initiative is, is focusing on this. Can, it's a connecting force across MIT. It's really quite surprising that we have a critical mass. We actually have a critical mass of scholars, of practitioners, of courses on this topic, and we're trying to kind of bring it all together and recognize that the um, the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. So the, the initiative has three core elements, practice-oriented research, and classroom experience that is very active, roll up your sleeves, hands-on. So the opportunity to, to develop a, an actual action learning program was just wonderful. And then we have a dynamic communication strategy where we're trying to reach out to business leaders and to workers and to others in, who are in this conversation nationally and globally about the future of work. And Martha Mangelsdorf, you can raise your hand, is our Director of Strategic Communications and probably will be reaching out to many of you over time to understand more about what our alums are doing. So USA Lab, USA Lab. Well, we had um, a wake-up call that we've got some real challenges right here in this country. And many of us here at MIT had recognized that we spend a lot of time focusing globally. We are a global institution, worrying about issues all around the world. And as a consequence of spending so much time looking internationally, we may have missed a lot that's going on here in the country. And so we decided to design an action learning program that is focusing here in the United States. And to adapt, to borrow, adapt, maneuver the process of action learning in the US context, but also focusing 
on places and people um, in a slightly different way. So we were interested in having this experience in the classroom and on the ground be completely focused on learning from our hosts. The hosts were people in small towns in rural regions in America who are poised to change the trajectory of their places. They were not business leaders. They were foundation leaders. They were community, they were, uh, community foundations, community development finance institutions. Um, these were organizations that had agency across the region that had depth on the, on the issues and who played a pivotal role in these places in making things happen. They had strong ties with business leaders, with civic leaders, and with everyday folks in their regions. Um, it was designed to enable our students to go out and explore these divides and to go out and understand this country in a different way. Um, and these were the hosts. So we have some, we have some uh, posters from the students' experience, but I'll tell you a little bit about what happened in each of these places. So they were in uh, Dubuque, Iowa. This community foundation of Greater Dubuque covers the whole region surrounding Dubuque. So while Dubuque is a pretty urban community, the foundation had broad span and was a coalition of several other um, uh, players in the region in that region, one of the most significant barriers to work for many people is the lack of availability of quality and affordable childcare. So our student teams were there to understand this issue, to understand how that, what are the implications of the lack of affordable uh, and quality childcare for the workforce, for the employers themselves, how does that create problems of absenteeism or make it difficult for them to attract good workers? Uh, what's the cost, what's the benefit of trying to figure out a way to generate more, more affordable and high quality childcare? So they spent a lot of time with business leaders, with parents, with uh, childcare providers, with civic leaders to try to understand this problem in this context, in this place, and its relationship to good jobs and good quality workforce uh, in these companies. Coastal Enterprises in Brunswick, Maine. So this is located in Brunswick, Maine. They focus throughout the entire state. Our team looked at the food and agricultural products opportunities in Maine. They went way up to Arista County. They were all over the state. They looked at the supply side. They talked to farmers. They talked to producers. They looked at the demand side. They talk, looked at high-end food uh, farm to table restaurants as well as distribution of foods and they looked at regionally and they came up uh, with a way of understanding what are the constraints and what are the opportunities for building more of a food sector in Maine and they understand that it, understood it from a cultural point of view where the resistant points are they understood it from uh, a marketing point of view and from just a practical distribution point of view and came up with some very exciting viable recommendations for, for working with seaweed and oats and, um, and cottage cheese, and they were just fabulous, and you can probably see some of that here. Pennies from Heaven Foundation, this is Ludington, Michigan, it's on the lake, it's a small town, it's a very coastal community, a seasonal community, and here they were focusing on, with a group of business leaders who were concerned about um, work work-based learning and improving the skills of their workforce. So they really um, came up with some wonderful ways for this group of employers to coordinate, to collaborate, to coach, to do a much more effective job bar borrowing from models around the country on work-based learning and employer-based training. Um, HOPE is uh, an organization in the Mississippi Delta. Um, they work with the whole region and they're a credit union and they provide small business loans and individual loans and, and provide financial services. And they were concerned that 
while the population was very much in need and demanding, they were concerned that there wasn't enough pickup uh, on, the, on their products and services. And so uh, our students really paid attention to that. They tried to understand in all of their branches across the region how the people who were working in Hope's branches interacted with their clients, what kind of coaching they provided, what kind of financial literacy issues uh, needed to be tended to. Did they look demographically? They, did they look at the age demographics and how they were relating to a younger population that might be coming into some of these places? So they got a real good sense of um, sort of the financial story in that region and the, the disconnect between um, the financial uh, products that are available and the population itself who very much would benefit from those products if they were uh, shaped differently or handled differently. And finally, RDI in, in rural Oregon, um, our student that was in Oregon, uh, the problem there was fish waste and they were in Garibaldi on the Tillamook coast and um, the state has, um, has fairly restrictive requirements about what you can do with fish waste. This is a big fishing industry um, for Oregon and uh, our student got to know the fishermen and the community leaders and the government leaders and the supply and distribution channels for primarily crab and other fish products and came up with a composting solution that, um, that what they can do with the fish waste is create high-end compost adding, which very much culturally connected to what was happening in Oregon. So you get a sense of the kinds of things they were doing. But the most important thing that happened is that through these products that were tightly defined and doable, and uh, th they got to spend time talking to people on the ground, getting to know what the pressures are, what the issues are, what the hopes and aspirations are for the people that live in these communities. They got to understand a lot about the power dynamics and the attitudes that they had about themselves, about the other. And so in understanding what was going on on the ground, it made what we were talking about in the classroom much more tangible. In the classroom, we were talking about America. We were talking about our republic and have we taken is this a have we taken a u-turn or is this part of the experiment we looked at it in historical context we looked at it looked at it in regional context we looked at the divides rural and urban we looked at racial divides we looked at gender divides we looked at all of it we looked at contemporary issues and historical issues and we tried to make sense out of all of this in our discussions as it was becoming more and more real when the students were spending time with their teams. And that's basically the nature of the action learning program and this particular experience. It really did bring together a diverse group of faculty members. Um, we had four of us uh, on the faculty team that developed and executed the course. It's very much part of the action learning program, but it also was inspired by and came out of MIT's Men's at Manus America initiative, which again is a response to the challenges that we're facing in this country. And, and it's really been a remarkable experience. I want to just read to you, I'm going to close by reading, um, I was just this morning reviewing all of the final reflection papers of the students once again, just so that it would be fresh in my mind. And there were a couple of things that the students said that I just thought it would be best if I read it to you. Um, the USA Lab is one of the most important classes to be offered at Sloan. That really made me feel good. And I feel incredibly lucky that I was able to take it before graduation. Given our current political and economic divides, USA Lab encourages students to explore the reasons behind these divides and think critically about them rather than rely on media headlines. Furthermore, business schools often emphasize international travel, highlighting the glamorous trips that can be taken during your two years out of the workforce. While I highly value international travel and have taken these trips, I think that USA Lab provides students with the opportunity to travel to regions of the world they may never otherwise see. Students travel and have the opportunity to meet with local residents in attempts to understand the local context here in America. And yet one more, a little shorter one. I think we have a tendency to overlook some of the internal issues. I read recently that 51% of Americans struggle to pay for basic needs. This statistic is staggering. But thanks in part to USA Lab, I wasn't surprised. 
For those of us who want to stay and work in the United States, I think it's important to understand the challenges that we face right here. So with that, I want to encourage you to stay in touch, to visit our website. If any of you are in a place that you think would be a good place for a team of students next year, we are going to do this again. And it's only going to get better as time goes on. So let us know. Give me your business card. Just come up to me afterwards. We also have some handouts to give you a little bit of background uh, on, on the lab experience itself. And, and anything more that you'd like to know, just send me an email and, or talk to me now. And I'll open for some questions. I think we've got plenty of time. Or I'll ask you some questions if you don't ask me any questions. Yeah. Tell me who you are when you, yeah. My name is Samia Basun. I'm an ambassador of the team. Oh, there's a mic coming around. Sorry. I think. Thank you. My name is Samia Basun. I'm from the class of 17, EMBA. Um, I have my own company in telecommunication called Capwave Technologies. It's to bridge the gap of uh, broadband access. Wonderful. However, uh, I'm a small company, a small startup. <laughs> so I've partnered with other companies. My question is when you, when you discuss hosts, for example, I live in a town now that's getting increasing, increasingly gentrified. 50% uh -huh. of, of our town is African American or Latino, and they're being pushed out to the west side of the town like many towns in America, sure. and it's creating a real economic divide. How, how can this help? Where, where are Asbury you? Asbury Park, New Jersey. Asbury Park, New Jersey. Well, how can this help? So let's just imagine a little bit how it might help. So is there a um, community foundation of Asbury Park, New Jersey? Yeah, there, there are actually many groups, diamond groups, uh -huh. center, all, all kind of groups. And is there one in particular that really is, um, seems to have credibility and can pull people together? Yeah. So that could be a really good host. Yeah, and the problem could be something around finding the right balance between gentrification and rooted economic development. Um, and you could be part of the, the group that would be sponsoring the students. But the main host would most likely, rather than being you the business, be a, an, an anchor, pivotal organization in that community that can bring the whole community together. And we have uh, learned from this experience and from the whole history of action learning what are the qualities that we're looking for in a host. And even though the hosts in this instance tend not to be businesses themselves, um, they need to be uh, in a position to really make this work for the students. The problems that the students would be working on have to be problems that are very relevant to the community. Um, there has to, they have to be actionable pro problems. They're not just sort of esoteric. So it's something that we could probably develop. Okay, and yep. should I contact um, Michael Yes, just I'll, uh, yeah, we should contact, right. We would though, I mean, I, I, we haven't made a final decision. We started really zeroing in on rural regions and small communities, and we may stick with that for another year, but let's just keep playing with ideas. Some other, let's let me look this way, this way. Yes. So the project begins the very first day of the semester. It's a semester-long project. The students spent two full weeks uh, in the field, but began working with their hosts in the very beginning. In the, in the next iteration, we're also thinking that we'd like to bring the hosts in the first week of class so that they can make that face-to-face -face connection, because that personal connection is really important. But, um, and we discovered that two weeks seems like a lot of time, but the students so valued that experience, and it really wasn't that much time. So we're struggling with how to make this, the, the, the field work, really work. But yeah. Well, you all um, signed up for this, and you were very eager to be here. So I have to ask you what, you, what your real interest is. Yes, I, before I start asking you questions, yeah. I was wondering if you could uh, just spend a couple more minutes talking about um, kind of looking back on your uh, first iteration here in the USA projects, um, your sense of how you'll define success going forward. Um, I'm also a little puzzled about you know, fitting some of these projects that are 
uh, rather ambitious, um, only because the value is very high, uh, in um, a somewhat artificial uh, time envelope of yeah. the term in which you can carry out what you're doing. Um, even when I was a student here at Sloan, uh, many, many decades ago, uh, I, I was involved in a lot of seminars or courses that were uh, project-oriented. But they were so discreet and focused uh, by the time they were presented to us as opportunities, whereas uh, some of what I hear you talking about here uh, is significantly involved with kind of defining the problem, the players, the interactions, uh, some of the preliminary buy-in that you need just to have uh, the foundation for a successful experience. Yeah. No, this is the, tell, tell us who you are before you let go of the oh. mic. Michael DiMarco, I'm a 50-year guy. Yay, good for you, yay, all right. So, so your question is a really good one and it's one that we struggle with. So um, all of these hosts had discrete projects. And so the students were actually quite successful because the projects were narrowly defined, very specific, and there was a beginning, middle, and an end that they could do in the course of a semester. Um, and the hosts would all like to continue and build on the first year. So the next year's project will be something related to the first year's project. And they'll be even better at kind of calibrating how far they can go. So I think among the hosts that were the, our pioneers, um, I think we'll have even a better sense. Uh, they'll have a better sense about how to make it work. But we were really surprised at how successful it was. Now, the, thing, the, the challenge is that we didn't want um, the course to be the be all and end all to be this rare, somewhat narrowly defined project. We, we wanted the project to be uh, a way to open the window on what's really going on. So it, we had to find the right balance between it being big and all encompassing and it being um, very concise and actionable. So I think we were successful, but it was more by chance that we were successful. But I think now we can be more deliberate about it. But it is really tough because we don't want, and some of the labs, it's all about the project. And in this lab, it's really all about opening our eyes to America and then making a contribution in the process and having the project be a vehicle for learning. So it's, it's a tough balance. But you, you, you nailed it. That is a challenge for us. Yes. Hi, I'm Rena Messier. I'm a 30-year graduate. I can't believe it. Um, could you talk a bit about uh, more about the project in Jackson? So was it really just to sort of segment who their customer population is or could be? Or uh, did they have um, a specific objective about increasing their lending or certain kinds yeah, of yeah, so products, the, or what was it? Hope Credit Union um, wanted to have more consumer take up of their products. And they were wondering what was going wrong. Why, why weren't they connecting with the population in the Mississippi Delta? And um, so part of the question was, do the products actually meet what people who are living in the, the sort of financial products, do they meet what the people in the Mississippi Delta would use, would like to use? They did an analysis of um, the students, and, and I think based on data that Hope already clearly had, um, how the pickup of various products in various parts of the Mississippi Delta region, the rural or the more urban regions, what the consumers were utilizing and why and how. Um, they also understood from an age point of view that in some, some of the smaller towns in that region were actually on the, on the move. They were kind of coming back and younger people were coming back in, whereas others there was a big drain of people coming out, but the products didn't meet um, the demands of, say, the millennials that are moving in. So, the, so part of it was, um, and, and a lot of it is coaching on financial literacy. This is, a, this is a nonprofit community development finance corporation and credit union, and they're interested in economic development for low-income people. So these weren't just to get products out the door. They were products with a purpose. 
And so part of it was the coaching style and the, the ways in which the, the various um, people who were interacting with the clients who were part of the credit union did their coaching. And so that's kind of what our team looked at. It sounds like it was an analytic exercise to educate the credit union about who their cu customer base is and it was an exercise where they came up with um, training protocols for their frontline um, employees who were coaching citizens but in the process um, the students spent a lot of time in the Mississippi Delta traveling up and down hearing the music tasting the food understanding the people and seeing where a, an organization like HOPE which is a community development finance institution and a credit union as a financial institution that, about which they do nothing before they went in, how these institutions actually, um, what the role, what role they play in these places around the country. Yes. My question is uh, somewhat related yes. to uh, that of the 50-year gentleman over there. Mm -hmm. um, are there any? lessons learned out of these coming out of these projects and hopefully future projects that you see as then being able to, to be translated or being brought to a higher level of policy systemic policy solutions or um, you know I think of what the poverty action lab does a lot and I think well is there a link from these discrete targeted geographically uh, projects and uh, to uh, bigger lessons I guess I'd like to say the answer is emphatically yes. And I come, uh, the, the part of my background that hasn't been mentioned is my, most of my career has been in public policy. So I, I would love to be able to say I see some real policy solutions. What, in listening to the students at the end of their experience, which to me was one of the most valuable lessons, they said things like, we realize that rural is not just rural. There's, and there's all sorts of flavors. That the Mississippi Delta is very different than Garibaldi. And that people across all of these places have the same hopes and aspirations for themselves and their families and their children. But we don't know how to cross those bridges and understand the differences and the similarities and have these conversations. And they were, their eyes were opened in a way that I hoped would happen. But I couldn't imagine it would happen to that extent. And and this sounds really trite, and we keep hearing it, though, over and over, that we sort of lost the ability to just open our eyes and go places and listen to people. And I don't know if there's a policy that we could manufacture that would make that happen. So I think that these, you know, project by project and place by place, we might begin to see things, you know, sort of, you know, well, so what, what, are there some reasonable policies that we some insights about the unbanked population and the role of credit unions. Sure, we could come up with something like that. Or, you know, the effect of the policy that is making it so difficult to deal with fish waste and the positive outcome of that, and is there a way of rethinking that at a state level. But I, I you know, I don't know. Yes, you had a question, and I guess we need to stop. I guess, yes, one more question, and then I have, the hook comes out, and I'm done. <laughs> I'm sorry, you said you're... I'm Frances, and I'm here for my 15-year reunion. Um, I was really interested in, in the insights because it sounds like the genesis of the program is to find out what's really going on. And in this age of polarization, I'd love to hear more about the way students change, like what preconceptions they may have had and what they told you they found out when they really went into these communities. That's a really good question. And we spent a lot of time in the beginning asking them what their assumptions are. You know, what, what do you think of this place? And, and, and what, how do you think of, we talked about issues around place and home and, and culture. And, um, and some of them just had some fairly simple, that we all have, sort of simplistic and stereotypical views of, of rural, you know, rural America. And it was all kind of the same, and it was out there, and it was different. Um, so I'd say that the, the biggest difference is what I said a minute ago, which is that they realize the texture in this tapestry that we call America, and that um, there's something very exciting about it, 
and there's a lot of opportunity out there, but there's a tremendous amount of despair as well, and that we kind of turn our backs on it as a nation in a sense that um, we don't really know what to do with it. But um, I'd say the biggest change is the recognizing how textured it is and how much variety there is. And one of the things that they said that they enjoyed a lot is the conversations as each team got to know their own place, the conversations across to realize that the food challenge in rural Maine has got some similarities to the seafood challenge in rural Oregon, but there are also some distinct differences. And, and the challenges in a coastal community like Ludington are very different than what you see in the Mississippi Delta. And there's lots of variety in between, so. Okay, great, thank you. But I'd love to introduce you to our two fairly recent alums, um, Brendan Makov, a class of 2015, and Shi Hong Chen, class of 2011. And they both are here in a very interesting capacity. Uh, they are not just students of action learning, but they've actually been involved in as a member of the teaching team, in the case of Shi Hong, uh, for our course China India Lab. We actually have another teaching team member, Melissa Webster, who's also an alum. And in the case of Brendan, Brendan's a senior product manager at TripAdvisor, and his role has also been to host a project that gives this unique learning opportunity. So with that, uh, I'd love to you know, get their perspectives on what made them connect with the school through these unique learning opportunities. And I'm sure as Bob was talking about you know, get engaged, we'd love you to ask those questions about how you would like to get engaged and, and learn from them what are those steps. So with that, Brennan and Shehang, tell us a little bit about um, sort of your engagement so far with action learning, both as a school and as an alum. Yeah, so I'd say that uh, practical learning in general was probably the main reason that I chose Sloan as a business school. In terms of action learning, uh, when I was here, I enrolled in the EM lab, uh, working with a large tech company that had an enterprise solution that was trying to break into the small and medium-sized business space. And then also with G-Lab, uh, with a sort of software, hardware uh, tech company in Sao Paulo that was having some difficulty with its sales practices. Uh, on top of that, I also did an independent study with a tech company a little bit north of Boston and built a business plan as part of New Enterprises. So sort of that action practical experience was really, really valuable for me as a student, both developing my skill set and sort of giving me some relevant stuff to talk about when I was interviewing. Uh, then I, after graduation, uh, TripAdvisor had a specialized rotational program for product management. Uh, every six months I rotated through a different team and during that, that time I helped host a team uh, of EM Lab students that um, did a lot of really interesting user research related to our um, burgeoning attractions business and really built out some user personas and did a lot of research for us. I can go into that a little bit more later. Sure, and uh, my perspective is, is sort of strange as well. I mean, first starting out as a student, and then actually as a host, and now actually as, as part of sourcing the uh, projects and as part of the China Lab teaching team. Uh, while I was a student here, I, I guess, uh, honestly, my, my understanding of action learning was actually very rudimentary. They're treating it very much as like, a, like sort of on the job, you know, sort of in the field type of, type of work. And uh, I was part of a program at that point uh, taught by Peter Senge, uh, LLAB, that uh, we were we were looking at sustainable potato farming, and that really opened a lot of uh, eyes. Um, we we ended up going to Las Vegas at the same time as CES, but as we landed, we basically told them we were not going to that conference. We were going to the other one, <laughs> uh, potatoes, and and and, and um, it was it was fascinating, uh, and I. To this day, I mean, I still remember all of the um, uh, um, just uh, being able to actually talk to the farmings and uh, farmers, and, and actually specifically about those practices. Um, afterwards, um, I uh, then moved to China, um, or moved back to China. I've lived in China and worked in China for for many, many years, nearly 15 years now, even though I grew up in Seattle. Um, and uh, at that point, uh, you know, Sloan would like wanted some help with actually sourcing projects in in China. And at that point, I sort of uh, got involved with sourcing projects. And now I think it's been the fifth year of sourcing 
um, sort of the 20 some projects in China. So I think uh, I was talking to Ermi earlier, now had the opportunity to see over the course of the five years nearly 100 or so projects um, and 100 or so you know, host companies and um, across, across the, the multiple areas that we actually are doing projects in China, Beijing, Shanghai, Guang, uh, Guangzhou, as well as um, uh, Kunming. Um, and through that process, I've also, you know, I've, myself, uh, I have a startup, and so we also hosted um, a China Lab uh, project ourselves. And so that's, that was also a sort of third perspective, and it actually helped actually increase sort of my understanding of, of action learning. Um, and so it's sort of, I guess, three perspectives, um, both as, you know, student, host, and then sort of, I guess, back staff. Um, and it's sort of really opened my eyes to, to sort of the value of action learning. We talk, when we talk about action learning, we talk about constituents. We say students, alums, host organizations, faculty and staff members, and you've been all of them, in, in, in you've played all of those roles. So tell us a little bit, as we were talking about over 100 projects, you, you've been a part of those engagements in, in some form or the other. What makes a good host to one of your earlier stories? I mean, what are uh, your questions? What is, what is a good host? So I, I think one of the understandings as, as I go out and now I'm, in some sense I'm pitching for, for, uh, for MIT Sloan's um, you know, action learning and, sort of, and, and to sort of try to understand a little more about action learning and, and just entire pedagogy uh, behind action learning. I, I think you know, one question you know, which the gentleman answered is, I mean, asked is, I mean, uh, I, and this is something I've talked to many other academics actually in China, like what is action learning, how do you define it, and is, is, is it just, I mean, what is a good project? Is the project very canned? <laughs> you know, I mean, and, and I think as we talked about this, we're starting to realize that, you know, the, the traditional case study method, um, and, and this is, I was talking to a dean at, at Funan University, one of, the, one of the universities actually in Shanghai. Um, the discussion was, was about, you know, sort of what business, business education and management education, what, what, what it's like. And while there's a lot of focus, you know, traditionally on the case study method, the case study method is, is actually very, very packaged. All the information has been distilled into a, into a very clear you know, um, you know, analysis, and you're supposed to go through this process and get an analysis. Whereas, to be honest, this day, I mean, this, this dean in, at Fudan University was, was very focused on the fact that um, the, the future of the world, actually, a lot of the analysis and a lot of actually this, this process can actually be done by computers now. And his argument was actually even, and this is very radical thinking, was uh, maybe even some of the strategic analysis can maybe eventually be done by an AI, you know, AI algorithm in the future. And so the, the question then comes into is, is uh, I mean, I've noticed this throughout my own career, um, is, is actually the key is that what is the question <laughs> you know, that you need to ask? And and a lot of times, if in a case study, you just that's sort of already done for you, right? But but that's actually the key is like how you define the question, who are your stakeholders, and 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 you know how to, you know uh, you know what it is. And a lot of times, once you sort of ask what is the question, then you start to sort of drive at the answer. But even without a asking the question, if you're asking the wrong questions, you you end up with the wrong wrong wrong, an wrong answers. So so that's actually what has been been interesting about uh, my sort of evolution in, in how I've sort of talked about action learning, whereas maybe the, the very first versions of, you know, as I was pitching this, was very, very project and focused on that. The, the other thing that I've noticed uh, when, when I'm working with hosts in China, um, they, they actually, it's, it's actually not a one-way learning. A lot of times we've, you know, if you look at the, you know, the discussion, I mean, or even the video, it's actually very focused on what the students gain. And, and that's true. I mean, I, as the students, um, the students learn a lot, they, they, their eyes are open. But the, the other side of it is actually the, the project, the, pro, uh, uh, the, the hosts actually, not only do they get a project or, you know, sort of a end result that looks like a, you know, an answer to a question, but actually just even going through the action learning process with the students and working with the students, that in itself is actually an educational, you know, sort of opportunity for the hosts to understand sort of a, a, a new uh, method of thinking and, and, um, and actually just sort of being, a, and that is actually a benefit. In, uh, and uh, as we've talked to sort of debrief many hosts, the, the hosts after have said that actually just being able to interact with these students and interact with people outside of our own culture um, is, was, was incredibly you know, important and, and it opened our eyes to a whole bunch of different other possibilities. So, um, 
I think to go, I mean, you know, I, I've sort of digressed a little about the, the, que the question that Ermi asked, but mostly just because I think it, it was important in my own evolution of action learning, and I think that action learning as a sort of a pedagogy is, is continued to be pioneered here, I think, at, at, at Sloan, and I think, you know, we're, we are, I think we're pushing a lot of it, especially when um, looking at China and looking at sort of all what, what the sort of the market is, you know, especially since I'm, I have to go source these projects, and, and, and some of the companies are, oh yeah, we do, we do projects, and I'm like, well, actually, you don't. The way we we do the projects and I think that's a that's a really important key um, but you know one of the things that we do ask the 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 um, projects I mean the project sponsors is is to sort of identify a que a question or a problem that they have that is you can say urgent but not emergency not a e not an emergency problem and I think that's key I mean something that's really pressing but it's not something that I need to solve tomorrow and 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 if it's if it's it, uh, oftentimes if the problem is so such an emergency then that doesn't lead to a very good project and it actually doesn't require the sort of you know um, the I mean, uh, the sort of it doesn't u utilize our students uh, because our students are students they're not consultants um, in in this and and I think that's that's also a very key sort of term is that a lot of times, you know, when we go into this, we, I mean, it has to do with the fact that many of our students actually have consulting backgrounds. They're like, oh, I'm a consultant. No, actually, we are, we are, we are actually, you know, we st it is still a learning experience, ultimately. So no, you, you, you're not treating them as a student, I mean, as a consultant. You know, they're not completely at the beck and call, which is, which is also really important. Um, the other issue, the other thing that we've noticed, again, about, um, the uh, it, using the term, you know, sort of urgent problem but not emergency problem is then to then challenge and, and help, and that's actually what's been, uh, uh, action learning is a very sort of hands-on and it's very staff intensive program, whereas, you know, uh, a professor spending some time can actually very quickly, you know, implement case studies for, uh, you know, teaching like 60 or 70 people at a time. The action learning requires, you know, hands-on staff. Like, you know, um, Professor Barbara has actually, and, and you have a staff of four, I mean, you know, even China Lab, and more than that, right? You know, it's... These are professors of four. Professors of four. Exactly yeah. <laughs> but, you know, you know your professors. Yeah, and, and, so, and so even for, for, for us, I mean, to, to be able to source and actually help scope the projects, um, is actually a very, very important factor into making it successful. So a lot of times, you know, the, the, for a, a company might say like, you know, I have this HR organizational structure problem, you know, help me with it. But, and that's, that doesn't really help, you know, just being able to scope it and actually asking the, even for, uh, as sort of the, uh, uh, you know, sort of sourcing the projects to help, uh, help ask a little more of the questions to get it closer to where it is to the point where um, now it's, it's not completely a canned answer, but there's still quite a lot of ambiguity and a lot of questions left. Those are sort of the projects that are, that are best for, um, you know, for, uh, for our students. Thanks, Shi Hong. So the themes are urgent, not an emergency. Um, it allows you to think, allows new methods of learning to be um, used both by the students and in the organization and it provides a learning opportunity for our students. Brendan, you had the opportunity of hosting uh, a student team in your first year, in your very first um, initiative, uh, but a, a job, and uh, that is pretty unique. Most people don't usually get to do that. You were part of that team, and you were working with that team on a regular basis, on a day-to-day -day basis. Tell us a little bit about that experience, how you saw it from that lens. Yeah, there's just a lot of different ways that you can give back and help out with the action learning. You know, you can do a lot where you're sourcing lots of different projects. Uh, technically, I wasn't actually even the host at TripAdvisor. I was sort of an ambassador and sort of helped other people at TripAdvisor realize that there's a lot of value in this program. As I mentioned before, I was in a rotational program where I was changing roles every six months, and those six months didn't line up with a semester. So it was very hard for me in that, that position. And I made a pitch to, to one of my colleagues, and she got really excited. She happened to be on our attractions team. And sort of she and I co-hosted a team, and it was really awesome where she, she drove a lot of the thinking about what st the strategy and the, the question we wanted answered while I sort of helped under, with the understanding about expectations on both sides, sort of what the students could handle and also what sort of drove a meaningful result. Um, you know, I think th what came up a few times is that, like, what is the question you want answered and sort of the urgency part of it. And this is, this is really uh, a key part of action learning where, um, you know, you need something that, that is you definitely want to do, but there's just not enough time in the day. You know, what is that project they can get on that, are, that they can get done? And then you sort of have a back and forth about 
you know, what is reasonable in terms of expectations, what's gonna be meaningful. And those first few weeks are sort of feeling out like what the project scope can be and what the deliverables, deliverable is gonna be. And you know, for really committed hosts, you can build on that uh, semester after semester, or year after year. Um, you know, in terms of actually working with them, you know, it was, it was about, you know, an hour a week uh, in terms of FaceTime and then, you know, a couple of hours beyond that preparing. But, uh, you know, I think, think back and the real value that I remember seeing from, from the students is the really hands-on research. They were going out to, to Faneuil Hall and the aquarium doing user testing for us and really pulling in really interesting insights that, you know, would require me to take an entire day off from work, which is hard to do. Um, and then, you know, on top of that, they go back and, and um, you know, with some of the, the more basic uh, analytics programs out there, we're able to summarize these results and provide some real interesting uh, conclusions uh, for us. Um, you know, in the end, it was, it was a really cool experience. Uh, now that I'm out of the rotational program, I'm looking forward to potentially hosting my own team. And uh, you know, I think, as I mentioned before, with EM Lab and G Lab, these are more on the marketing strategy side of, uh, of sort of the action learning offerings. Um, but my background is a lot more in the analytics side and sort of the type of students that uh, will apply for and, and be admitted into A-Lab really have a strong technical background and I'm sure that we can find some cool projects for them to do in the future. Uh, and then one thing you mentioned that I want to uh, touch on is sort of, um, this was actually something I realized while as a student, but um, the things you don't know uh, as a host. And uh, one of the most flattering things that happened after G-Lab is sort of on our second to last day, the host sort of asked me and another teammate to sort of draft a job description because they realized that they didn't have the skills on the team to, to continue our work. Um, A-Lab, by the way, is analytics lab. Uh, so I know that we use all these short forms and ac acronyms, but necessarily not something that you might be aware of. Thank you so much for sharing that, Brendan. I know we have just a few minutes, and I just wanted to have this opportunity to open it up. So as you're thinking of, um, and, and this doesn't mean that you, know, you have to start hosting a project right now with us, but it's just, uh, this is an opportunity of engagement with our students on things that are happening in your organizations, on questions or that could be answered or could be explored, rather. I wouldn't really venture to say answered. Uh, we have Brendan, Chi Hong, Barbara, myself, Melissa, my colleagues, Laura. Um, it would be great if you have some questions around action learning in general that you wanted to ask at this point. I just have a yeah. Question. Yes. Are there any um, uh, financial expectations that the hosts have to cover? So the question is around financial expectations, and the the answer first is that there is no consulting fee because it's not a consulting engagement. If there is any kind of expense associated with travel or local uh, you know, Ubers in the case of Brendan's team, those are the things that one uh, needs to uh, consider uh, paying for. But other than that, there isn't a consulting fee as such or engagement fee. Yes. For 10 years, and I'm ready to go back, and I'm wondering what resources you have that are for um, alumni who want to do the action learning themselves. <laughs> uh, can, can I organize something for my organization where I can draw on MIT alumni who can work with a team and solve a problem with my, with my organization? <laughs> There are two alums yet. I, you know, Melissa and Shi Hang. Let me let me open it up to you guys for for trying to answer that question, and then I can obviously talk a little bit more. I mean, I think it's it's interesting because that um, companies have actually asked me that question in 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 China, where where some HR departments are want to set up their own action learning sort of program within the HR department because ultimately, I mean, that's action learning. I mean, if we believe this stuff, I mean, and we really do, is that ultimately that this is action learning as a, as a methodology is a great way to develop your own, you know, human talent, human, you know, human capital. And, and so, um, you know, they, they've asked me like, oh, well, can we set up our own little sort of action learning maybe, you know, program and, and then, you know, some of the, the new hires or, or maybe it's like a mixed team. Um, can then like sort of pull together and, and go answer a question that, you know, again, a pressing question that executive or one of, one of the management, you know, sort of committees have, have thrown out. Um, I don't know, this is ultimately, Ermi, I guess, you know. Yeah. So uh, Melissa and I are working on actually developing a, a, a method, a facilitation session and a series of sessions and training sessions of how you can take an action learning method into your organization. 
um, and when, when we have that ready, we'd, we'd love to get that engagement. But at this, at this point, really it is about, uh, we could even have a organization, a host or uh, team, yeah, a team being hosted at your organization that actually facilitates those kind of thinking processes through a problem that could be explored. Other questions? Well, with that, so I, Barb, did you have any? Thank you. Yes. Uh, how do you decide the scope of what topics you're, you're trying to tackle? Uh, That's a great question. And, and the question I have uh, is just thinking about, you know, a need that I think is common in a lot of places that we have to work on locally is foster children and matching with adoptive parents and how mixed up that process can be and challenging and finding a success from that. Mm -hmm. I'm just curious, uh, you know, what kind of, how do you guys pick a particular topic uh, to, to go after? So that's a great question. How do you, how do you pick up the topic? And as I, and then Chi Hong has mentioned, this, the engagement model is not that of a consulting model. So we start with the course and the courses have teaching objectives because they're trying to teach either a function or a discipline or an interdisciplinary problem. And based out of that, there we come up with what are the types of questions that we want to explore and what are the organizations and the size of organizations we want to work with as a result of that. So that's the starting point. It's the course. Um, so, But for something like what you are talking about, um, that it could be looked at at various lenses. It could be looked at with an operations lens, and actually there is a course around that um, that works on that. It could also be looked at with a course that uh, thinks about put all your you know management education of one or two years, and then go and work with a local nonprofit in um, over a couple of weeks, and look at a very narrow specific problem, but but try to help them with that. Then that course is very differently designed. It's for the executive uh, MBA uh, students. And we could, it, it could fit into that purview as well. So it depends a little bit on the, how, how the question is being asked and how the question is being explored. But the starting point is, uh, is the course and what the course objectives are. Does that capture it? Yeah. So with that, uh, I really want to thank Barb Chi Hung and Brendan for being part of the conversation today that engages students into the real world. And we hope that you get got a little bit of that glimpse about what action learning is, how our students are being taught in this very signature, deliberate, pedagogical approach that MIT um, fosters. Thank you so much for your time.